Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 5 from our Cohen 7th edition Microbiology textbook. This chapter covers eukaryotic cells and microorganisms, so let's go ahead and get started. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. All right, let's go ahead and start with eukaryotic cells. Remember that all life came from an early precursor called the last common ancestor. And I had mentioned before that from the last common ancestor, there, there was a branching that happened where two different species formed. And one of those went to become the bacteria, the domain bacteria, and then the other branch ultimately branched again to form the archaea and the eukarya. Do you remember that from chapter one? And this is why we say that archaea and eukarya, those two domains are more closely related to one another because they share a more recent common ancestor than either is to bacteria. Okay, but the earliest eukaryotic cells did appear around 4 billion years ago. And what's really interesting, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, is that since then we've also realized that we have prokaryotic cells living inside of our own cells. Eukaryotes have a mitochondria or numerous mitochondria. Um, we also have plants and, and, uh, algae that have chloroplasts and it's been shown now that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts are actually ancient prokaryotic cells ancient bacterial cells that were phagocytosed or engulfed into the early eukaryotic cell in a process known as endosymbiosis and later, those bacteria became the mitochondria and the chloroplast. And we have several pieces of evidence to support this. Both the mitochondria and the chloroplasts have their own circularized DNA, just like bacteria. Remember, bacteria have their own circularized DNA. They have the 70S ribosomes, which I'm going to show you in this chapter um, that you know, eukaryotes have 80S ribosomes and prokaryotes, uh, specifically bacteria, have 70S ribosomes. And the, the chloroplasts and mitochondria have 70S ribosomes of their own, which are totally unlike your 80S ribosomes. They synthesize their own proteins. They have their own two-layer membranes, just like gram-negative bacterium do. Uh, they divide like bacterium with binary fission. They, if you sequence that DNA, the sequence aligns nicely with prokaryotic or, or bacterial genes and not eukaryotic genes. And we could go on and on about all the ways that mitochondria and chloroplasts, you know, resemble bacteria. Now, they can no longer grow on their own. They're no longer considered bacterium, but, you know, they originated as bacteria. And that's known as the endosymbiotic theory. Isn't that neat? And remember, with eukaryotes, there are multicellular eukaryotes like you and me, you know, the, the animals. There are also plants, but there are eukaryotes that are always unicellular. These include the protozoa. There are eukaryotes that may be unicellular or multicellular, including the fungi and the algae. And then there are eukaryotes that are always multicellular, like the helminths. Remember, helminths are worms. And it's usually the egg or the larval form that infects the human. And that's somewhat small, right? That's microscopic. Now, what are some features of all eukaryotic cells? We're going to we're going to touch on just a few of these. Remember, all cells, not just eukaryotic cells, but all cells possess a plasma membrane, that's the phospholipid bilayer around the the cell. 
a, you know, eukaryotic cells in particular have a nucleus, which means that their chromosomes are inside of a double membrane structure. Eukaryotes possess mitochondria usually. They have an endoplasmic reticulum. They have the Golgi apparatus, vacuoles, a cytoskeleton, and some form of glycocalyx. Now, some eukaryotes have a cell wall. For example, plants and algae can have a cell wall of cellulose. Fungi can have a cell wall of chitin. But not all eukaryotes have a cell wall. Eukaryotes can have locomotor appendages, such as a flagellum or cilia, or form pseudopods, right? But obviously not all. And eukaryotes can have chloroplasts if they are photosynthetic eukaryotes like algae. Here you can see a generalized structure of a eukaryotic cell. Look how many membrane-bound organelles are inside of the cell. The nucleus itself is a membrane-bound organelle. Then you have this convoluted membrane outside of the nucleus. See right here, this is, this is the endoplasmic reticulum right here. Here you have the mitochondrion. Here you have the chloroplast, the Golgi apparatus. You've got vacuoles. You've got the plasma membrane. Okay, so look at how many membrane-bound organelles there are inside of the cell and compare that to a prokaryotic cell, a bacterial cell over here. Notice that the bacterial cell is far simpler. It's far uh, you know, smaller. And the reason it's smaller is because it doesn't have all these bulky structures inside, right? So remember that a prokaryotic cell is usually about one to five micrometers in diameter, whereas a eukaryotic cell is usually between 10 and 50 micrometers in diameter. This means that a prokaryotic cell is typically 50 times to or 10 to 50 times smaller than a eukaryotic cell. And remember, some eukaryotes possess a flagella, a flagella for motility. Now, what you should know is that eukaryotic flagella are quite different from bacterial flagella. First of all, they're 10 times thicker than, than bacterial flagella. They're structurally much more complex. They're actually covered with a membrane, uh, the extension of the plasma membrane. Inside of the eukaryotic flagella are hollow microtubules. You may have you may have learned about microtubules, which is a cytoskeletal component in a previous biology course. Well, there's nine doublet microtubules surrounding two singlet microtubules. Let me show you. If you were to cut a flagellum, uh, a eukaryotic flagellum in half and take a look at the cross section here, you would see this is this is the cross section of the flagellum. You have these are doublets of microtubules, so double microtubules. Notice that there are nine of these doublet microtubules in a circle surrounding two singlet microtubules in the center. This is known as the 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. And remember, bacteria, they don't have a structure like this. And then you'd have the plasma membrane around this 9 plus 2 arrangement. Whereas in bacteria, the, the flagella itself, the the filament of the flagella is made up of fil uh, flagellin, a protein known as flagellin. And that's pretty much it. Um, also, do you remember when we learned about the prokaryotic flagellum, the bacterial flagellum? Remember I said it literally spins. It spins like, you know, as if you stuck a whip onto a propeller of a boat, right? It literally spins. But in eukaryotic flagella, you should know that there is no spinning going on. It's a whipping motion. So there's like a fish tail back forth, back forth. You can imagine a sperm cell swimming, right? A sperm cell swimming, its tail beats back and forth. Whereas in bacteria, that tail is spinning, literally spinning around in circles.
Here you can see cilia. Cilia are another form of the extension from the cell for motility. It's similar in overall structure to a flagella, but you know, creatures can be uh, covered with cilia. These cilia are shorter and more numerous than flagella. There are only one group of protozoa and certain animals that have cilia. And cilia work in a little bit different fashion. So again, cilia are short hairs that beat. The way they beat is via power stroke. So there's a power stroke and then a recovery stroke. So think about, you know, when you swim the, the breaststroke. If you're swimming the breaststroke, you do a power stroke and then you recover. Power stroke and then recover. Um, so think about that with, with uh, cilia. It's known as an oar-like rowing motion that occurs. And this can either be for motility or to feed. You know, sometimes these cilia might be near a feeding groove or the mouth of the organism and the cilia beat guiding food particles down into the mouth of the organism. Now, just like bacteria can have a glycocalyx, an outermost boundary, um, then you know eukaryotes can also have a glycocalyx, also known as the extracellular matrix. Uh, you know, these animal cells have an extracellular matrix or ECM. It's composed of polysaccharides. Remember, we learned about this in a previous biology class um, in biology 1406. You may have heard of the ECM, the extracellular matrix made up of collagen and proteoglycan complex. Uh, that together makes up this sugary proteinaceous substance on the outside of the of the cell. Now, some bacterium, some eukaryotes have a cell wall, right? Fungi and algae are known for having a cell wall. Fungi typically have a cell wall of chitin. Algae and plants typically have a cell wall of cellulose. Remember that all cells have some kind of cytoplasmic membrane, including prokaryotic cells. The eukaryotic cytoplasmic membrane is selectively permeable, which means it allows nutrients to enter the cell and waste and other products out of the cell. Now let's talk a little bit about the kingdom fungi. Remember fungi are eukaryotic microorganisms. There are two groups, the macroscopic fungi, which you can see with the naked eye, obviously mushrooms, puffballs, gill fungi, things like this. And then the microscopic fungi. These are the ones that you need the assistance of a microscope to see it clearly. These include the molds and the yeasts. Now, yeast cells are interesting. Yeast cells are round to oval shape. I call it kind of oblong shape. They can use asexual reproduction, but also they can use sexual reproduction as well. Now, molds, on the other hand, they have what's known as a hyphal shape or hyphae, which are long thread-like cells. These are found in filamentous fungi or molds. Here you can see a yeast cell. This is a yeast cell, which I said is oval shape or oblong. And yeast cells can divide asexually by forming what's known as a bud. You see a little bud forms with the genes inside, you know, the chromosomes inside. And that bud will pinch off, leaving behind a scar. See, when the bud forms, the bud can pinch off, leaving behind a scar, a bud scar. And pretty soon the yeast can be covered in these bud scars. Now, where do fungi get their nutrition from? Fungi are saprobes. Saprobes obtain substrates from dead plants and animals. This is the, the typical way that, that fungi get their nutrition. You know, fungi are known for breaking down dead organic matter. And that's what saprobes do. When you hear saprobes, you should think obtain their substrates or obtain their nutrition from dead plants and animals. 
and you know fungi they tend to be heterotrophic that means they acquire nutrients from a wide variety of substrates that have carbon in them so you know you can think of them as preformed carbon molecules such as sugars and things like this some fungi they serve as parasites parasites live on the bodies of living animals or plants and become metabolically dependent on them they get their nutrition from uh, from that animal or plant again you can see here how some fungi are saprobes you see how these fungi are breaking down the berries you know and breaking down that organic matter whereas some fungi are parasites they feed off of the living uh, animal or plant now when we're talking about molds remember i said molds fo form as filaments or hyphae these molds form a mesh a network of hyphae and that that woven that woven intertwining mass of hyphae that make up the body or colony of a mold are called mycelium so when you see this fuzzy stuff here on these berries this fuzziness this is the mycelium it is it's it looks fuzzy because it's a network of woven uh, mesh of hyphal or filamentous cells and if you zoom in you could even see the filaments of these cells molds are also known for forming spores not endospores don't mistake endospores and fungal spores they're two completely different beasts endospores are highly resistant to heat and chemicals and drying out remember the bacteria form endospores when i'm talking about fungal spores Fungal spores are reproductive bodies. They're not nearly as resilient as bacterial endospores. They're mainly for reproduction. So here you can see uh, the bread mold called rhizopus. This is the bread mold, rhizopus stolonifer. And I want to show you kind of its life cycle. The first thing that happens is that a spore floats around in the air and it lands on let's say bread once the spore lands on the bread it forms a germ tube it can germinate that germ tube becomes an early hyphae uh, these are hypha that hypha can branch and move throughout the bread and that's what you see when you see that whitish green fuzzy stuff on your bread after a while if you've left it out for a while you see that fuzzy stuff that's the mycelium that's a network of these hyphae and then at some point these surface hyphae or these aerial hyphae form they form hyphae uh you know long the tall in the air and these are known as vegetative hyphae and at the tips, at the tips of these tall hyphae form reproductive hyphae, these, these reproductive structures. In this case, this structure is called a sporangium. This is a sporangium. With rhizopus stolonifer, they form spores inside of this cap, and that's known as the sporangium. And then the sporangium, this, this cap bursts open, releasing those reproductive asexual spores. And yes, this sporangium is an asexual structure, and it releases all these spores. And those spores are free to uh, disseminate, that means spread, and germinate to form more hyphae on probably some bread or fruit nearby. Okay, so this is the life cycle of a bread mold, Rhizopus stolonifer. And by the way, Rhizopus can also undergo sexual reproduction as well. And the way that works is really neat. A, a negative type, uh, a negative type hyphae will encounter a positive type hyphae. These are opposite mating types, or you could think of them as opposite sexes. They will come into contact. Those two hyphae will come into contact and 
uh, there will be a fertilization event that occurs forming a spore called a zygospore. So uh, when we t when we go to lab, I'll show you the difference between the sexual zygospore versus the asexual sporangiospore, which I just pointed out in this life cycle here. What's also neat about fungi is that you can tell them apart uh, sometimes based on their spore formation, like how they make their asexual spores. So for instance, I showed you the sporangiospores, right? In the sporangium of the Rhizopus stolonifer bread mold, I told you it looks kind of like a cap with those spores inside, the asexual spores inside. And yes, this is a telltale uh, signature structure of uh, Rhizopus, but there are instead of sporangiospores, sporangiospores, which are inside of a cap, you could have conidiospores. Conidiospores are uh, these spores that form without a cap. The, the spores are naked. Okay, They don't have a cap. And there are some molds that form conidiospores instead of sporangiospores. So let me give you an example. Here you can see some conidiospore. And you can see that there's no cap surrounding these spores. And this would be probably from Aspergillus. Uh, Aspergillus is a mold that forms these conidiospores and they kind of fan out. I, uh, they're like broccoli shaped, broccoli shaped spores. And uh, other molds would have different structures of conidiospores. So for instance, penicillium, which is famous for giving us the antibiotic penicillin, it had spores that kind of all point in one direction. I, I call them like finger-like extensions, you know, because they're all kind of pointing the same way. It kind of looks like a broom, <laughs> okay, or finger-like extensions. So it's really neat. Again, the sporangiospores are inside of a cap. The conidiospores are outside of the cap. They are all types of asexual reproductive spores that mold make, and you can you can they can help to identify the mold based on the structure of those of those spores. And again, here's here's an example of sporangiospores. There's a sporangio cap here with the spores inside. See the difference there. So remember, most fungi are saprobes, meaning they break down dead organic matter. However, some can be pathogenic or parasitic, and uh, the, the human fungal infections can occur through accidental contact with soil, water, dust, even uh, from skin-to-skin -skin contact. On the other hand, we can make use of fungi for their beneficial impacts. They play an essential role in decomposing organic matter. They form stable associations with plant roots. These are known as mycorrhizae, and they help the plant root to absorb nutrients from the soil. They can be used to produce antibiotics, alcohol, organic acids, vitamins, food flavoring. All kinds of products come from the fermentation by fungi and yeast. Think of also bread. You know, we use yeast to make bread rise as well. Now let's move on to the protists. Remember that protists are usually single cell eukaryotes, though sometimes various types of algae can also be multicellular. So the protists include algae, which are photosynthetic, and proto protozoa, which are more animal-like. A protist is any eukaryotic unicellular or colonial organism that lacks true tissues. So even the multicellular algae, like let's say seaweed or kelp, these lack true tissues. They are, they are considered colonial organisms, but usually the protists are single cell creatures. Let's start with the algae, which is a type of protist. 
The algae are photosynthetic protists. And you guys have heard of green algae before, I'm sure. Green algae is included. Everyone knows about seaweed and kelp. Now, these are types of algae, but there are microscopic algae as well. These can be single cell organisms like this filamentous algae or these diatoms. Diatoms are really neat. They are photosynthetic algae, but they are single cell organisms with a cell wall made of silica or glass. Algae are widespread inhabitants of fresh and marine water. They are huge photosynthesizers on the planet. They produce about 70% of the Earth's oxygen. You know, a lot of students, they think that, you know, plants and trees are responsible for most of the oxygen that's produced on the Earth and most of the photosynth photosynthesis on the planet. However, it's really this plankton, it's these microorganisms that are producing the lion's share of that oxygen. And these diatoms are really, really central players in that oxygen production here. So thank you to the diatoms for producing Earth's oxygen. Now, plankton, these are organisms floating uh, in aquatic environments. They are essential in the aquatic food web. They are at the base of the food chain. You know, when you think of the food chain, you think of the shark eating the fish, the fish feeding on the smaller fish, and then the smaller fish feeding on brine and even smaller uh, organisms. And ultimately, at the bottom of that food chain are the plankton, right? Those are the bottom of the food chain, which are essential for the rest of the food chain too. Now we're moving on to the protozoa. These are animal-like single cell organisms. There are a huge number of these, 65,000 plus species uh, identified. They usually inhabit uh, moist environments, fresh water, marine water, soil. While most members are harmless, a few species are parasitic and they are responsible for human infections as well. Protozoa are single cell organisms. They are, you know, not photosynthetic. They can have structures that are analogous to mouths, digestive systems, reproductive tracts, and even legs. However, remember, as advanced as they are, they're still a single cell organism. These are animal-like, meaning they feed like we do. They don't feed on, you know, sunlight and CO2 like plants do. They feed off of uh, organic, complex organic molecules. So they are heterotrophs like you and me. They, they feed off of organic material. They can scavenge dead uh, plants or animal debris. They can graze on living cells. They can even be parasitic. They could live on the fluids of the host. They could live in the digestive juices. They can be actively feeding on tissues as well. Now, protozoa are classified based on their motility. Some protozoa cannot move at all, so they, they're not modal. However, some protozoa they move with pseudopod motility. These are known as false feet. Pseudopod translates to false foot. And this is a type of amoeboid motion. This means motility that involves the plasma membrane extending out, attaching, and then retracting, kind of dragging the organism around by shifting the shape of the organism forming pseudopods. If you've ever seen amoeba moving around, this is what we're talking about. Other protozoa can move with the assistance of flagella. Flagella, remember, are these long uh, whip-like structures. And these are eukaryotic flagella, so they have the 9 plus 2 microtubule arrangement, and they beat back and forth, right? They beat back and forth. The cilia, on the other hand, some of these protozoa are ciliated, and these move with a different type of motility. Can you beat Wicket? You know, Wicket has been kind of quiet in this video so far, but can you beat Wicket? Can you tell me uh, what is the difference between how flagella and cilia beat? 
flagella beat back and forth like a fish tail, whereas cilia beat in a, that's right, wicket, an oar-like fashion, right? Power stroke motility. That's right, there's a stroke and a recovery. And there are several ciliated uh, protozoa that, that we'll learn about. Here we can see some of the four types of uh, locomotion in protozoa. Here you can see this is an organism with a flagellum. This is the flagellum, the long whip-like structure. On the right, you see an amoeba with its pseudopods, right? You see how it's extending the pseudopod is extending uh, this false foot right here. This is an amoeba, which can extend and retract these pseudopods. Uh, below, you can see cilia. Here, there are some cilia. Uh, these are called stentors, and these are a type of uh, protozoa that can move its little cilia to filter feed, to push uh, you know, debris and food into the this mouth structure, this primitive mouth structure, to feed. Now, several of these protozoa have two main life stages. They have the feeding stage, also known as the trophozoite stage, as well as the dormant stage, known as the cyst stage. The feeding or trophozoite stage is the modal feeding stage, this is where the organism is alive, it's metabolically active, it's moving around, searching for food, uh, and it needs ample food and moisture to remain active. Remember I said that protozoa live in moist environments. Now, there is also the cyst stage. The trophozoite can form a cyst, and this is a dormant or resting stage. It's formed when conditions become unfavorable for growth let, and feeding. Let's say the, there's not much to feed on, there, the moisture is dropping, the moisture level is dropping, and it's an important stage for spread of disease as well. Sometimes it's the cyst stage that you ingest or that can infect you uh, as if it's a parasitic organism. Here we can kind of explore this concept of the trophozoic and cyst stage and how it co comes about by looking at the general life cycle exhibited by these protozoa. Let's start with the first part of the life cycle, the trophozoic or active feeding stage. The organism is alive and well. It's, it's a moist environment with nutrients, so it's growing, it's moving, it's digesting, it's doing all of the functions of life. If there's a lack of nutrients or drying conditions, this triggers the cells to round up and lose their motility. They enter the early cyst formation. Later on, they form a mature cyst, which is that dormant resting stage. Later on, if moisture or nutrients are restored, this cyst can open up, the cyst wall breaks open, allowing the trophozoic to reemerge and become reactivated and the feeding continues. And this is known as the general life cycle of uh, protozoa. Now, when it comes to how these protozoa reproduce, there are asexual methods, usually through just mitosis. The cell will undergo mitosis and divide asexually, or two different cells can uh, sexually reproduce via conjugation, where there is a form of genetic exchange when two cells come together and conjugate. And remember, some protozoa can be pathogenic, and the study of parasitology is the study of these parasites, these protozoa and helminths. Remember, helminths being worms. We can study how these protozoa and these helminths cause disease. The parasite is the term uh, for the protozoan or the helminth pathogen. So let's look at some organisms that are protozoa that cause disease, starting with amoeboid protozoa. Remember that amoeboid protozoa are the ones with pseudopod motility. Entamoeba, for instance, 
causes amoebiasis, which is an intestinal uh, disorder, an intestinal disease. Nigleria, there's actually a problem with Nigleria in the southern states of the United States, uh, where this is a amoeba that can get into the brain. And the way it causes a brain infection is that people will do, uh, they'll dive into murky water, you know, into lakes and such. They'll get this amoeba splashing up into their nose cavity. And then the amoeba will travel up certain neurons from the nasal passageways, you know, at the back of the sinuses up to the brain. The amoeba will then grow in the brain and cause massive brain infection and, you know, likely death. There are ciliated protozoa. Remember ciliated? These are, these are protozoa that move around with cilia. Balantidium, for instance, this, is, this causes balantidiosis, another intestinal disease. There are flagellated protozoa. Remember, these are the protozoa with at least one flagella. There is giardia, which is a very common uh, cause of intestinal distress. You know, they call it traveler's diarrhea or giardiasis. Trichomonas, which can cause trichomoniasis. Uh, this is uh, reproductive tract symptoms. It can cause, uh, you know, infection of the reproductive tract in humans. Trypanosoma. Bursae, this causes sleeping sickness, African sleeping sickness. Trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease, a dangerous disorder. Leishmania, which causes leishmaniasis. Again, these are all flagellated protozoa, and these are the diseases that they can cause. Here are some non-modal protozoa. Remember I said you, some protozoa are not modal. So plasmodium, for instance, not modal. This is the cause of malaria, which is, you know, the reservoir is the human and it's spread by a vector, the mosquito. Toxoplasma causes toxoplasmosis, which is a flu-like illness. Cryptosporidium causes cryptosporidiosis which is another intestinal disease, and cyclospora, which causes cyclosporiasis, an intestinal disease as well. So again, remember, protozoa are characterized based on their motility. Some are non-modal, some are flagellated, some are ciliated, and some move with pseudopods. Those are the amoeboid organisms. All right, and last but not least, the helminths, the last group of eukaryotic organisms that we will study. Remember that helminths are worms. They are multicellular eukaryotes. However, it's usually the egg or the larval stage that's ingested. There are flat worms, which are thin worms, and these thin worms are often segmented like this. You see these little segments here. On the tapeworm here. And these flatworms are divided into two groups, the cestodes or the tapeworms as depicted here. This, this guy right here is a tapeworm. And the trematodes, which are the flatworms as well, like the, this one here. This is the fluke. This is the liver fluke right here. Okay, so there are flatworms. Okay, and then there are the roundworms, also called the nematodes. These are long, cylindrical, unsegmented body types. Now let's talk general worm morphology. Worms are usually large enough to be seen with the naked eye, but some roundworms are less than one millimeter in length. So some worms can be very, very small, almost microscopic to our to us. Worms are multicellular animals equipped with organs and organ systems. The reproductive tract of these organisms is the most developed, but they can also have primitive digestive, excretory, nervous, and muscular systems as well. They can have cuticles for protection, mouth glands for breaking down the host tissues, and many are parasitic. 
What about the life cycle and reproduction of these worms? The complete life cycle involves a fertilized egg known as the embryo, a larval stage, which is an early growth stage, and then an adult stage, in which case there are, you know, reproduction occurs or more eggs are formed. The majority of helminths derive their nutrients and reproduce sexually in the host's body. Now, when it comes to the life cycle and reproduction of worms, the nematodes have different morphologies for the sexes, which means they have a male worm that looks a particular way and a female worm that looks a different way. It has a different morphology. Cestodes, remember, cestodes are like the tapeworms. The cestodes generally are hermaphroditic. This means that they can possess both the male and the female gametes, the sperm and the egg. So you, generally, for instance, if you have a single tapeworm, that single tapeworm is hermaphroditic. It can make the sperm and the eggs, so it could do sexual reproduction with itself. You do not need two separate worms to make offspring. Trematodes are somewhere in between. Remember, these are the flukes. The trematodes have the sexes are separate. Um, or you could have, you know, examples where they're hermaphroditic. The male and female sex organs are on the same worm. So it depends on the worm. And again, remember, once the egg is formed, the transmission of an egg or larva to the body of another host occurs, either a different or the same species. Then there's an intermediate or secondary host, the host in which the larval development occurs, and then a final or definitive host, the host in which adulthood and mating occur. Now, what are the sources for human infection? Where do we pick up these worm infections? Well, commonly, the most common is food and water, you know, food that has not been prepared correctly or food that's contaminated with these worm cysts. Uh, or eggs. Um, you have water, you know, water that has not been treated or filtered, soil, infected animals, especially fecal matter from animals. What are the routes of infection? Well, oftentimes worm infections are taken in through the mouth, right? There's oral intake. However, you can have penetration of the skin as well. Humans happen to be the definitive hosts for many species uh, of worms and the sole biological reservoir for about half of these worm diseases. Animals or insect vectors also serve as reservoirs. So a reservoir is known as, you know, the definition of a reservoir is where you normally find that organism. Some of these organisms reside in animals. Some reside in vectors, you know, these insects such as uh, mosquitoes or other biting insects. And here are some worm-associated diseases or helminth diseases. I'm not going to go through all of these, but be, uh, be uh, aware that there are nematodes or roundworms that cause disease. You may have heard of some of these like trichinella, which you can pick up from consuming you know, undercooked pork. Um, there's also flatworm diseases. Remember like the cestodes, which are the tapeworms. So there's tania, which is the pork tapeworm, again, by eating undercooked or raw pork. Uh, there's also a beef tapeworm. There's the trematodes, which are the flukes. Remember, so schistosoma is the blood fluke. Uh, blood disease in humans. Again, um, although although worms are macroscopic and multicellular creatures, we still study them in the realm of microbiology because it's usually the egg or larva that's consumed or that infects the human. So it's pretty interesting stuff there. All right, and that about takes us to the end of chapter five. A nice little look at various eukaryotic microorganisms. I hope this was informative. Let me know if you have any questions in the comment box below, and I'll catch you for the next chapter. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.
A doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. A doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D.